welcome to another episode of Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture beats the First World War. Uh, I'm Angus Wallace, and as ever, joining me is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kepshall, and with us today is Holly Nielsen. Holly, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So we're going to be discussing board games and where they intersect with the First World War. But before we get to games, Holly, what is your background as a historian? Uh, so I'm doing my PhD at the moment at Royal Holloway. Uh, I'm looking at British board games and the ludic imagination, uh, circa 1860 to 1960. Um, so ludic imagination is just a fancy way of saying both the roles that uh, these games played in people's lives, but also what they tell us about society's more broader conceptions of play. And yeah, and so I did my MPhil, where I also looked at British board games, uh, which is the chapter that you guys read that hoping to send to a paper, where I looked at uh, board games produced uh, during the First World War in Britain. And yeah, and then before that, I've been a, a games journalist for a while, mainly looking at video games. But I found, yeah, the kind of intersections between play and history has been my my thing for a, a, a couple of years now. I wonder if, if we should start just before the First World War. And I wonder if we're looking at uh, military board games. Are they popular pre-war? And if, if they are, what are they based on? Are they sort of colonial conflicts or, or are we seeing a run into a where, where they're envisaging a, a european style war so war has it's kind of it's been a popular topic for board games for a long time because well i guess i mean you have chess and things like that and idea of tactics translating to board games uh works very well and kind of tabletop war games um as it were kind of uh, people like hg wells and things like that doing their uh, their kind of tabletop war games and yes, yeah, so it's been it been around for a long time, and there's kind of um, there's kind of an intersection between geographical games and war. So there's kind of games that were produced that kind of to do with the Boer War. I have some really lovely uh, examples of um, a woman talking about her childhood, where she remembers her brothers playing a Boer War game on their kitchen table, and she wasn't allowed to join in because she was the annoying younger sister. So she would play the kind of, um, as she described it, the avenging, uh, avenging kind of wind, and she would blow all their pieces off the table. But she liked to clarify that she was always on the side of the British, even though she was the avenging wind spirit <laughs> as she described it so war has always been a popular thing it's always kind of um kind of as that young girl remembered it's always a very gendered thing as well um some of these games are advertised as being kind of quote-unquote gender neutral but they they weren't really <laughs> not or they, they weren't experienced in the same way uh not that not that young girls or women didn't play these games but there was a there was a perception that these kind of games were kind of for these kind of masculine martial energies and they were kind of safe ways for for young boys to channel these instincts and things like that. Can I ask about games publication? Because you had a moment in your chapter where you're talking about what sounded like two different versions of Ludo. Um, And I was just curious, are there lots of games publishers at this period? Do they overlap? Are they producing very different games or similar games? Or what, what sort of context are we talking about here so the first kind of dedicated game publishers appear in britain kind of the late 18th century and they're kind of uh a lot of them are quaker and they're educational ephemera publishers and board games are a part of that and then as you start to get changes in the printing process in the kind of late 19th century you get a kind of um toy and game manufacturers publishing a lot of board games and a lot of them are the same games essentially uh they're snakes and ladders they're ludo they're kind of roll and move derivative games they're all very very similar um and that's where ludo is a complicated one because there's a a bunch of people put in the same patent around the same time and it's all a bit complicated but essentially ludo is the game pachisi uh which is an, an indian game that's very old and it got brought over or well seemingly it seemed to have got brought over with colonial families and then Pachisi got introduced and then you get a kind of British rebranding of Pachisi and it becomes the old British game of Ludo and then you get the new exotic game of Pachisi despite the the discrepancies being quite big. (laughs) It's a a beautiful framework for just viewing everything about Britain and the empire through. (laughs) Look at this amazing thing we've discovered and invented for ourselves and by coincidence here's an alternative version. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah and you get like yeah it's all the kind of old popular british game and and then you get the yeah the new exotic version of this game which is you know 
hundreds of years older than the, the old British version of the game. Um, and the, the British versions of the games are often incredibly simplified and more aimed towards children. Um, interestingly, kind of the original games are much more complicated, they're much more tactical, but then Ludo and kind of Snakes and Ladders is another one. Uh, they just kind of get simplified and uh, made a lot less interesting. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> you're aiming at children, and then should, so I hadn't realised that it's Little Wars comes out in 1913, which I've never actually read Little Wars. I only know about it. Is that, and that's obviously quite a, it's a, it's a technical, Te- technical tactical war game isn't it little wars yeah little wars is a kind of almost like a kind of rule book but it has a lot of hg wells kind of belief in you know he's kind of he's kind of i guess kind of like philosophical approach to these games and why he thinks these games are important and things like that um he also produced uh, a, a oh god the name's totally escaped me another book that i use quite a lot uh where he says you know the british empire will be built from nursery floors and the idea of kind of and it's a rule book well not really a rule book it's about him playing with his sons and kind of this idea of here are ideas for fathers to play with their sons and they're often kind of war based but he also laments the fact that you can't buy um you can't buy non military figures so he kind of suggests a bunch of uh, a bunch of non-military figures for toy makers to produce in the middle of this book. And one of them is like a little separate jet and there's, you know, market sellers and things like that. So it's a very it's a, it's an interesting thing because then there's also an element where it's a, he kind of encourages like, oh, we're going to play um, a, a game where a, a British colonialist is going across to, you know, quote unquote savages. Um, but he makes a distinction of being like, oh, but we're a good imperialist. You know, we're not going to kill them unless they attack us first <laughs> kind of thing. So he's kind of making these distinctions through the kind of play that he's encouraging fathers to have with their sons. As if we look at the First World War, are people fast to jump on the, bandwagon to link their games to the war is there is there a sort of story arc of 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 games of of the games as they go through the war yeah so pretty much almost straight away so board games are pretty good in the fact that they can be published incredibly quickly and a lot of the games are very similar so you can kind of just lay a a topic on top of a pre-existing game and you can advertise it as being oh well this is the Boer War game this is a game about suffragettes and they're all essentially the same game but they have a a kind of layer of veneer on top of it and the the First World War games come out very quickly and they're kind of uh, I describe them as the kind of race to Berlin games that kind of appear and a whole bunch of them appear and uh, and they make a lot of money as um, they were kind of companies, you know, basically built on their race to Berlin game. And in journals at the time, uh, toy and game journals are saying, oh, there's not a if any home that has a board game will have this race to Berlin game. And they're essentially these very they're just uh, roll, you know, kind of roll and move games that you're playing as kind of allied forces of Britain and the whole goal is just to get to Berlin and the idea is like once you get to Berlin war's over you won that's it (laughs) and also because of the type of games these are that means it means that they see the war as inevitably you know you you inevitably win the game there's no way that you can lose this game it can be delayed you know you might uh, not roll as many high numbers you might land on squares that you know stop you for a little while but there's no way of losing the war in these games and a whole bunch of these games appear they appear in children's magazines um and then they kind of they kind of die a death. They kind of disappear fairly quickly, actually. And you start to get instead these much more tactical focused games, these games that are about tactics. They're about you can technically lose. Britain can lose the war in these games because someone is playing as Germany, someone's playing Britain. And they're, they're very intense. And there's an idea of um, you get this uh, idea of authenticity coming in of like, this is what it feels like to be a general at this time. And it kind of, you have these quotes from generals and from military figures at the time saying, ah, yes, this is exactly what it feels like, you know? And I I guess there's a sense of almost kind of taking control of the narrative or kind of gaining a kind of closer, all of a sudden you can be a child or some of these games are, are advertised to older, to older ages as well. And there's a sense that you can take control of the war essentially you can you can have a closeness and a proximity to it. I'm having images of General Melchett in goes <laughs> Force and his tabletop games. Um. Yeah. With the the advertising of these games, how how are they pitched in the kind of the newspapers or the children's magazines? Is it kind of a it's your patriotic duty to buy and play this game, or is it kind of a the war's happening? Why not also play? Is it what what's the level that they're pitching it at? So the games are very much 
a lot of them are kind of and it's similar to a lot of advertising that you see during like for board games at this time everything is kind of advertised as the essential game like you need this game you know your family will fall apart if you're not playing this game together you know and things like that so everything is kind of seen as 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 a very essential purchase yeah they're they're very but that's but that's similar to a lot of advertising at the time for these games um I've kind of read stuff where they said um during the First World War, the kind of um, Made in Britain stamp was the first time that these that, that stamp appeared in board games at the time. But that's not true. They, it appears earlier. And in, for certain companies, companies that had a base both in Germany and in Britain, they made it a little bit more clear. Like, oh, no, this is, don't worry, we're, we're British now. <laughs> it's fine. You can buy our games. It's fine. Um, but that stamp actually appears before the First World War. Um, so I think if you looked at these games in isolation, like you just looked at the games that were produced at this time, it is, I mean, it's still the, the kind of how quickly they were manufactured and how it, and just how they dominated the, the market at the time is, is pretty remarkable. But also, if you look at them in isolation, it would seem incredibly kind of, oh, wow, this is totally out of place. You know, there's made for Britain everywhere. They're kind of really pushing them as essential and all of that. But actually, that has a much longer history and actually kind of just game and toy manufacturers at the time were kind of doing that already before the First World War. Thinking about the audience, because you 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 were saying about the the greater push of authenticity, and I know that one of the games you talk about in your chapter um, it markets itself as being played in you know by cadets in training, so as something for you know as part of war preparation almost, if you will. But you were saying how the games industry emerges from what sounds more like early childhood education, what sort of age, ages are these being marketed at? Are they being marketed at very young children? Are they being marketed at sort of young adults as, as part of preparation to go to war? You know, young men who are imagined that they will eventually join up or their younger brothers who would hopefully be too young even for the longest war? They're not really uh, pushed towards any particular age and a lot of them not even towards uh, a particular gender although I think the gender bias is implicit in it even though they say oh it's for it's for boys and girls of any age I think the marketers are essentially hedging their bets and they're saying it's for everyone <laughs> you know it is it's I don't think they I don't think everyone necessarily played them um but the marketers are very much I think that's why um sometimes um uh, board games are kind of seen as oh well they're uh they're really interesting to look at because they're you know quote unquote gender neutral they're and I and I think Board games are interesting because they were played by a lot of people, but your gender identity, your class, all of that, it affected how which games you played and how you played them very distinctly. I was wondering about the uh, artwork and uh, uh, you know the way it it represents the war. I think if you bought if if you found a First World War themed game now, it would be all about mud and the blood on the cover. I think um, the Great War, Chris, is, you you've got that as a box set. It's all tanks and trenches, isn't it? Um, uh, how are that? What's the artwork that goes with these? Is it is it is it any vague, realistic depiction of war on the cover? So the kind of race to Berlin, the kind of early war race to Berlin games are very. They're kind of abstract. They're kind of geographical based, but not totally accurate. Kind of the kind of generalized maps, and then a kind of game placed on top of them. And sometimes there'll be kind of a pictures of you know of of soldiers and stuff like that but there's you know you will never see an injured soldier you'll never see kind of actual anything like that in these games and then when you get to games like um crom which is the tactical game that was kind of aimed at cadets uh, that jessica was mentioning before and had then had a more complicated version uh that you could play if if you were seen as 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 you were kind of post cadet as it were that's very much a kind of um i guess a, a kind of what would be seen as a military map at the time it's not a it's not an accurate depiction it's not anything like that it's a kind of a kind of step back aerial view there's no closeness as it were there's no there's no you're not seeing the faces of soldiers or anything like that so basically toy and game manufacturers the the games industry was kind of pointed as uh, by the government as an industry that was seen that could thrive during and post-war because obviously Germany had a real market on the toy manufacturing. So British government said, okay, toys, this is your chance to, this is your chance to shine essentially, uh, take over from them. And a lot of toys uh, um, are manufactured and the toys kind of, as the war goes on, get more and more 
kind of grim, I guess. You get kind of toy soldiers, which are seen to have injuries. You get field hospital toys. You get um, a game, which is, I think if, if you're a collector, it's kind of the most, one of the most expensive games you can try and find because it's highly explosive. So there's not many of them left, um, which was an exploding trench, essentially. It was a kind of trench and there was a kind of part chemistry set, part trench, and you would make it explode and, and you know, toy soldiers would go flying. And you get a kind of, you start to get a bit of a backlash against it. You start to get a a backlash against what's seen as these quote unquote morbid toys. And what I find interesting about that is because there's no sense that war isn't a thing that's appropriate for children to play as. It's realistic war that's seen as an appropriate thing um, to play as. You know, there's no problem with playing at war, but don't show injuries, don't show blood, don't show damaged buildings. So is it it possible to collect some of these injured soldiers says the woman who's researching disability after the first world war at the moment i was about to say i know what i'm getting jessica for christmas <laughs> yes 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 find me the amputee please <laughs> not to not to date this recording um <laughs> so i think this is an area i'm not as uh, this is this is mostly for me talking to archivists who know far more about this like specific area than i do but apparently um this is the kind of the first time that uh, injured uh toy soldiers uh kind of are sold that kind of you know amputee soldiers and soldiers with kind of physical injuries are sold so I think I think there is definitely as far as I'm aware there's 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 you know there's as there is with most stuff like this there's a market for people who are interested in collecting these items I find that really interesting because I think there is like for like throughout the entire period there's a there's a pacifist push against there's that's always there that's not saying that n- nobody ever said that children shouldn't be playing with you know toy bayonets and children shouldn't be playing with this there is a there is a pacifist uh push against toy weapons but on the on the large scale the idea of playing at war it's it it becomes repulsive to people when it becomes realistic uh war that's when people kind of start to to that's when you start getting you know kind of opinion pieces being written and uh and things like that the, the kind of the games and toy industry, it's very much opportunistic. <laughs> it's very opportunistic. It's actually whatever is happening, they will push out a toy to 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 try and uh, to to make money off it. And then post war, you get this kind of almost like commercialization of peace. Uh, this idea of uh, that's when you get kind of the marketing phrase "war without tears," and games like for games like that, where it's this idea of very much okay. We've seen what war can do. We've seen how horrible it can be. Here's a war game, but it's war without tears. It means that your kind of your young boys will be able to play at war, but they won't have to experience the trauma that we've seen. You know that society has seen, um, which I think is really interesting. Just that just the phrase "war without tears" is very telling for what they're trying to market. It's just, the the just to go back to the the disabled soldier. You know the injured soldier. Um, it it feeds into the debate about just how visible long-term disability is if you know you have this moment where where the disabled soldier is visible in the toy market and then that disappears um which you know forms part of that larger argument that people like deborah cohen make about the the invisibility and, and the hiding away of the wounded certainly within within popular culture um so yeah very interesting i think quite a Phew, the name totally escapes me. Sorry, my memory is awful. I should have a big list of just names and stuff. But there is it. There's a toy manufacturer. It was a charity and it was um, uh, disabled soldiers and they made games. They made board games. Um, and so that was kind of uh, seen as a popular thing. It was this uh, kind of disabled soldiers and uh, women taken over the roles were seen as uh, the toy industry and the games industry was seen as a kind of a an appropriate place to kind of make money and raise money. Yeah, particularly for the facially injured. I know they made games and stuffed animals. I was going to ask if there was a because it's a big as part of the French market for games. I seem to remember maybe I don't know. Was it two? When did we have the society conference at the Imperial War Museum? Was it two thousand and nine? Something like that. Um, uh, 2010. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, 2009, you're right. Yes, it was Fantastic. 2009. Sorry. Yeah. Someone gave a paper there about the French, kind of the, is it Mutier? Um, soldiers who were injured who then got sh- moved into creating toys for children. And it, the whole thing was branded in a, you know, this was made by a French soldier who was wounded in the field of battle protecting La Patrie and all of that type of stuff. So I was wondering whether or not there was a, 
a British version of of that. Yeah, there was, and I think, uh, and they, again, the name is totally escaping me. It's Lord something or other, and they made games. And I remember one game in particular they made. They made a kind of Saint George, Saint George's game kind of thing, like a very obviously like very patriotic, as you say, like a similar thing of kind of you know. Oh, these people defended our, you know, defended our country, and now they're making these very patriotic games um, for a younger generation. Who, who gets to unpatriotically play the Germans in uh, in a combative game when you uh, when you're at war? It seems quite a contentious thing. Who, hands up, who's going to have to play the Germans? That's always a thing I found interesting. So my PhD, I, I look, I'm looking more at the actual play that happened with these objects, um, which takes a lot more time and research to actually and looking at lots and lots of oral histories and and things like that. And and that's a big thing is that that I kind of talk about is like play as a site of contention. And I always think about that when I think about Chrome and these tactical games is that someone someone had to play Germany. And I think, but I think the kind of the way they kind of almost get around that is by having this tactical different like distance as it were it's like it's like yeah that kind of sense of oh no we're, do, we're doing like a, we're learning we're learning a tactics game here and so this is a valuable process and and the distance helps but yeah I have I have always wondered that and I've I actually I gave a talk to local historians uh, in Essex about these kind of games that were produced and afterwards uh, this guy came up to me and he actually I had with him one of the games that I talked about and he said oh I used to play this with my brother but we never had the rule set for it so it was really interesting to hear what the actual rules were but he said that his old basically his older brother would always make him like would make up the rules and make him play and and that's a whole other like complicated thing when you look at the actual play happening with these games is that the rules that were given is not necessarily the play that happened with them so it, it, there's, there's a whole other layer of stuff going on. <laughs> So, so in terms of your research, your source material is your are the games themselves, but also the the sort of memories of people who played the games. And does that have you been focusing just on the wartime and the post immediate post war period, or have you been looking at how these games, you know, as you say, get handed down and and rules getting lost and and things like that? So for my MPhil, just because of time constraints, it was much more of a kind of top down view of mainly looking at the games themselves and the designer intention. So from the games themselves, we can see designer intention. You can see more about the publishers, but you don't actually see anything about the play that happened with them. Um, occasionally you get glimpses at it when uh, like my favorite thing to find is when someone has written on a board game or like scribbled on it. And, and then you get like a little glimpse at how these games were used. Um, but that's very rare because obviously archives want to collect the, the, the quote unquote best specimen of the game, which means something that hasn't been written on. And then as a play historian, I'm like, no, please, <laughs> please collect the ones that have been kind of actively played with. So then, so yes, yeah, so the games themselves, you can see mechanics of the game, you can see designer intention, um, but then to see how these games were played, the play that actually happened, I look at a lot of um, oral histories. So I've recently gone through um, the the Thompson Edwardian oral history collection. So went through and took so long because there's almost, I think there's almost like 500 separate things and I had to read through every single one and I've made a big got my big uh, my beloved charts now <laughs> that I've spent so long on um, and found that of that collection 51% of um, of all of them mention a board game by name so I'm quite strict on it has to be by name and it has to be uh, and all of this and I've got lots more data but my my lovely lovely data that I spent so long collecting uh, but yeah 51% mention a board game by name which is a lot um, and through those uh, through those interviews you get so the kind of three aspects that I'm looking at is space um, uh, relationship and rhythms of play so the idea of where people were playing when were they were playing and who they were playing with essentially and yes and that idea of kind of um, these games being passed on and being a kind of a, a site for particularly familial uh, kind of interaction is a big thing kind of one of the suffragette games I look at it's uh, it's 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 really wonderful because Museum of London actually kept uh, the data of who gave it and why they gave it and it essentially it was bought uh, it was brought in by I think it was a someone it was their grandmother's game and their grandmother kind of supported the suffragette cause but felt that she didn't have the time or resources to actually quote unquote as she saw it be a suffragette so she bought this game on the street and it kind of and they never really talk about playing it but it got passed down through the family kind of as this kind of site of of remembrance and this kind of you know it wasn't a game as we'd think of it but it was kind of almost a kind of 
their, their grandmother or their great grandmother's way of kind of of showing her support for the cause, which I thought was was really lovely. These time specific games, as you said, the games industry is uh, is very responsive to a specific moment. Do ones that are specifically about the First World War get passed on? I could see, you know, Ludo or Parcheesi or you know whatever variation <laughs> getting passed down in a family. But does it do these games outlast the moment of their production? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I know that the well, I'm, I have that man that came up to me with the First World War game, and and so he, so it was a thing that him and his brother played in the kind of sixties. So that was something that was kept by the family. Um, I don't have a lot of, unfortunately, um, the kind of archives that I used. Uh, they don't have the information of of who these games belong to and things like that. Most of them are from private. Most of these games come from private collections and then people give their private collections to the uh, to the archive. So there's kind of a lot of stuff is lost in that process. But I think I think there's kind of this so kind of one of the games that I look at was a game that was published in a kind of children's magazine. And um, you can tell that it was actually played because the little uh, the the child that had it kind of mounted it on cardboard and you can see like little pin marks where they've moved the item along. So it's it's quite a fragile thing, but it was kept and uh, and so I don't know why it was kept, you know, why it was kept as a kind of as 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 a mark of the war or their experience or or anything like that. But I know it was kept. Unfortunately, not not a lot of detail. Just thinking in regards to your point about the the suffragettes game that was both a game and kind of not a game, but was also seen as a, a measure of support. How do we define games in this period without using the definitions that we do now? So, for example. Would we class the Ouija board as being a First World War game? Because I'm pretty sure at the time it's owned by Hasbro or owned by Waddingtons and people use them to contact soldiers in the trenches. But the idea of calling a Ouija board a board game, I don't know, post-exorcist doesn't really seem like a, <laughs> like a natural turn. So the Ouija board and kind of like automatic writing and planchettes and all of that is is... I find personally really interesting. I don't cover them in my research because if I start to get really broad, then I just, I end up with a huge amount. Cause you could, you can kind of take it to a point where I could say kind of um, uh, certain street games like hopscotch could technically be a board game because if you yourself are the other player moving across a, a board, which is the self written thing and things like that. So you can take, you can take it to all these things and actually Ouija boards and all of that were often advertised in the same spaces as board games it was there was kind of a big crossover and actually I find I'm get this is going to end up being a like a research tangent that I go on because I just find it so interesting I always feel sorry for the archivists when I I have like some wonderful archivists I work with and they're so patient with me because if there's a uh, a Ouija board or a planchette or an automatic writing thing I always <clears throat> I always love to see it even though I know it's like this isn't going to be directly for my research but they're just these wonderful objects but yeah, but there's I've, I've, the aspect of the way they're marketed. Sorry, this is a bit of a tangent. Is really interesting because sometimes Ouija boards and planchettes were they weren't seen as contacting other people. They were seen as uh, contacting your inner self. So it's like, oh, see what you yourself are going to. So this kind of idea of agency and and what's happening with Ouija boards is really interesting. Um, and actually, I just when I was going for the oral history, um, one of the last ones I read was. Um, a man talking about how after his father died, him and his siblings would use a Ouija board to try and contact him, but only when their mother was upstairs and they knew she wouldn't come down because their mother was really superstitious and wouldn't even allow cards and dice in the house. So a Ouija board was totally unacceptable. Maybe I will mention that in my research. I don't know. That's a particularly interesting one. Um, There's Owen, Dav- Owen Davies in The Supernatural War talks quite a lot, you know, for obvious reason, talks a lot about Ouija boards. But he he one of the points he makes is is the that that very fine line between superstition and entertainment because it's not just the you know going to see a medium could be a form of upper middle class entertainment. This is what you did on a Saturday a boring Saturday afternoon. It wasn't necessarily about trying to to um, it, it was as much about killing time as it was about trying to contact someone from a deep belief in spiritualism. So, um, yeah, there, there are all sorts of interesting blurred lines between play and superstition between and entertainment and uh, training for war. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of things going on. I, I think your research sounds fascinating, basically. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> I think the spiritual stuff I find really interesting because I do think a lot of kind of um, the idea of kind of either using a Ouija board or going to a medium, I think it is a 
a playful experience, uh, not necessarily in that, you know, kind of playing a game in the sense that we think of it, but in the idea of kind of interaction and progressing something and gaining something, it is a, it is a kind of innately playful thing. And then, and of course, like the, the commercial crossover, as I said, like these things are often advertised in the same spaces, they're produced by the same companies. And yeah, so I think, I think there is a, there is something there which I may or may may not go down for this PhD but it has been the back of my mind for a long time of wanting to explore it a bit more. Do do board games make it to the trenches? Um, So there are some pictures uh, again but it's difficult but the pictures I've seen are advertising material they're they're from the sense of wanting to get authenticity and the sense of oh look soldiers are playing this in the trenches and oh you know this and there's particularly like Anzac soldiers are seen as oh look these Anzac soldiers are playing our game and isn't isn't that wonderful and doesn't that make you want to play it and uh, and so yeah there's there's stuff like that and there's um there's some uh oh it just popped into my head there was someone talking about but again this always has to be taken with a pinch of salt because this is advertising material but an idea that soldiers were playing it in uh, field hospitals that when they were uh, when they were injured and recovering they would be playing these games but again these are the this is the publisher saying this <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah <laughs> I'm not thinking I'm gonna to have to go back to my hospital magazines and see if I can find any references oh that um, would be brilliant something something <laughs> not from the publisher themselves would be would be great because they yeah they are everything like that has to be taken with a bit of pinch of salt they do talk about entertainment so they talk about gramophones and, and pianos and, and things like that so there might be something in there I just I wasn't looking for it last time <laughs> I read these this... sources anything in there about uh british and german trench uh, soldiers walking out on christmas into no man's land to play ludo <laughs> <laughs> to argue well, over monopoly <laughs> yeah well, here's, here's a qu- are they about trenches or you know i was thinking uh, I, i've been trying to rack my brains for more modern versions of first world war games and actually from the 80s there's, there's lots of air war games board games what com- part of the conflict are they playing as a board game is it all trenches or one might have thought from a British point of view to make it all naval where we've got a whacking great navy and we're definitely going to win. It's a foregone conclusion. Hurrah. Or are they going for the Knights of the Sky daring do uh, uh, Lord Flash Hat? <laughs> the big old protocol. There's a lot of naval ones. As it, there's a lot of ones which are about uh, protecting Britain's shores and kind of uh, you play the navy and you're trying to kind of protect Britain and stuff like that. And and uh, and there are they, it kind of gets combined with during this time, or at least I would argue during this time. So like there's a shift in geographical games. So in the kind of 19th century, games around geography were very much about where you go and what you'll see when you're there and these places. And then into the kind of early 20th century, it becomes much more about how you get there and, and you're taking a plane or you're taking a motor car. And I think there's this ideas of like modernity getting wrapped into kind of these new modes of transport. And so I think these kind of games, which are around kind of flying and things like that kind of get wrapped into that because these games almost existed before this because it was kind of like travel around the world in a plane. And all of a sudden it's like, your first world war pilot now and it's the same game but uh but just kind of yeah wrapped up in something a bit different slightly takes me back to the exploding game and and you have to wonder if you you're mixing game board game in a chemistry set did anybody do a poison gas game um, or was that a step too far not that i'm aware of but i wouldn't be wholly unsurprised if if if, if that did exist because the yeah the exploding trench is a is a particularly I just I just love that it's so expensive because it's so volatile. <laughs> it's you know <laughs> <laughs> the, the the fact that anybody would think that would be a good idea to give a child, you know, I say oh. this as the mother of two young children. This is like, oh my God, what were they thinking? <laughs> yeah, the games some of the games when you see because I look for a lot of um uh like trade journals. Uh, I look through a lot of trade journals and so they have a lot of like patents in there for new games and new toys and things like that and some of them you do see and you're kind of like oh my god like I was looking through some of my research photos and there was one of it it was a it was a bath toy that had a lot of electrical wires and battery packs and things involved and just kind of you just kind of they're going oh god <laughs> Where do these games survive the war? If if not in you know like the mechanism, if not the game, and get reskinned. Or, or is it, that's it, at the end of the war, they're not really that good and we all move on? So the kind of the kind of roll and move games, they're kind of always about. They just get reskinned for various stuff. Uh, they're, they're, they're kind of always there in some form, essentially. Uh, the tactical games, again, kind of 
game more specific tactical games like from i don't really know what happens to them yet i haven't managed to track down what happens to Chrome, whether it gets rebranded, whether it is, because that is very much tied into its kind of mechanics itself are very much tied into the war. So, so how does that, how does that live on? Um, and unfortunately at the moment, I, 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 I don't really know what happened to Chrome, but yeah, but definitely some of the other ones, they just kind of get reskinned, rebranded um, kind of, yeah, that kind of war without tears thing happens. That idea of it's essentially the same kind of uh, military game, but this time it's, it's about kind of, uh, it's a safe way of exploring these kind of, you know, as opposed to what actually happened, it's a safe way of doing it. Because uh, post-war you get kind of much more uh, emphasis put on things like Meccano and building games and engineering games and things like that. But the military games never really go away. They're pretty much a constant. They just kind of have peaks and and and, and troughs. With regard to the to the post-war, because you said the 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 war was seen as kind of an opportunity for the British toy industry to kind of shake off the Germanic influence and stand on its own two feet. Does that play out post-war? Is the British board game and toy industry more of a kind of a uh, an individual autonomous industry after the war? Uh, it grows it, uh, as an industry. It kind of, um, it makes more money, <laughs> things like that. And obviously Germany is in a state afterwards that there's a, there's a kind of open market, but then you get um, America and Japan uh at this time are starting to do pretty well in terms of the to- uh, the game industry so the british the british toy industry does it, it 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 gets stronger it makes more money there's and things like that but you start to get other other things happening you know germany is kind of as as the toy industry is kind of um uh wiped out for a little while but you still have america you still have japan and things like that so it does a bit better, but I don't think it lived up to to the to the to the government's expectations in some ways. But I think that's debatable. Maybe people maybe argue against that. It's just back to back to that earlier point we were making about uh, disabled ex servicemen being trained in the toy industry. Is is there a government subsidy of this? A couple of years ago, uh, my the men, women, and care team and I did some exploratory work with the artist Patty Hartley who works on uh, facially disfigured. He creates art inspired by the stories of men with facial disfigurement. Um, And a couple of his subjects were retrained as game makers. And as I say, stuffed animal uh, makers as well. And my strong impression from those stories was that these, they were on, you know, Ministry of Labor, government subsidized programs. So is there government subsidy of the toy industry going on after the war to to, to fund these things? As far as I can remember, yes, because it's one of the industries that's kind of earmarked by the government as seeing one that can grow. Um, so I think it is how I, I did just remember that actually one of the problems of the toy industry, British toy industry was that the quality was seen as inferior to um, America and, and, and things like that. So it had a real it had a real kind of um, PR problem to shake off, essentially, uh, of, of kind of British toys being seen as, as, as inferior and not as good quality and things like that. Um, as far as kind of specific government uh, funding, I off the top of my head, it's um, I can't remember exactly, um, but I do know that it was it was earmarked uh, by the government as one of the industries that could thrive. Has the time come with a level of trepidation and honest to God weariness that we need to talk about Monopoly. <laughs> oh God, yeah, the spectre that looms over all my research. Particularly the most recent cursed version of Monopoly. Oh God, yes. There's so many cursed versions of Monopoly. It's staggering, really. <laughs> the the first World War Monopoly board game set, uh, yeah. I mean, the thing that I find really interesting with Monopoly is that there is it's 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 almost like the modern version of these role and play games that were reskinned in the early 20th century like the race to Berlin type games because there's no kind of consideration for mechanics and the, the meeting of mechanics and message isn't really considered a huge amount potentially and so you get with monopoly like you get kind of i found i saw english heritage monopoly which i thought was at its very core kind of the buying and selling of hadrian's wall and things like that also <laughs> potentially kind of would that not be earmarked as potentially problematic but uh when, when, when was the first world war monopoly published 
I mean, so it, it wasn't a centenary thing, was it? Or, or did it come out during the centenary? No, I think it's only come out this year. Which is just a weird choice of timing, as much as anything else. Because, I mean, you know, the, the point you were making about, about again, like the games industry picking up on the moment and trying to reflect the historical moment, why, to bring, it, why bring it out a year after the centenary? Um, if you're going to do it at all, seems seems bizarre to me. Yeah, but I, I I don't really know what's going on with Monopoly in terms of modern Monopoly and their kind of their choice of branding and their choice of various <laughs> kind of things. Is a it's 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 a bizarre it's a bizarre thing. Monopoly wasn't really around at that point. I do have this Monopoly does get a bit more interesting during the Second World War because it was a game that there's in kind of. Um, in uh, shelters and air raid shelters there's kind of old monopoly boards that were found and things like that and this kind of and it was a, a game that was played during it's sent to prison camps as well isn't it yes yeah it was it was sent to prison camps and there's a kind of whole escape thing just to make your life more tedious we're going to send you monopoly <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah that's what i find some of the advertising for these games is I find really funny because it will it will sometimes just admit it's a tedious game. It will be like, oh, it's the infuriating game of of so and so, and I'm like, that is it. That's a bold marketing strategy. <laughs> <laughs> what I found it funny was that I was thinking back to my own youth and 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 wars that happened when I when when I might have been buying board games, and like I don't recall anything toy wise to do with the Falklands War or anything toy wise to happen you know go for one when it was when it's all happening yet they're producing board games around the first world war as it's as it's happening it's kind of super uh, capitalism let's just get in there and, and not worry about the uh, morals of it throw ourselves at it and kind of to the point where at the outbreak of the second world war the government actually uh, it kind of uh, commissioned a thing from Harrods kind of checking how the, to- the the toys that were sold and the toys that were popular in the outbreak of the Second World War, which I think is really interesting. Almost like they've kind of they saw what happened during the First World War and they've kind of they're keeping an eye on what's happening with the British toy industry and what toys are popular and who are what you know uh, what are people buying. Especially if it's Harrods, it's a large you know middle class audience and things like that. But that's a lot of what it yeah. So that's got me thinking about you know are these toys a recruitment tool you know for the first world war when you've got two years when you've got people having to volunteer to the act as a recruitment tool you don't need that during the second world war because conscription comes straight in so you, you potentially can have a, a, a the government don't need to uh yeah because there's in. i mean kind of games as military recruitment has a depressingly long history um there's games in the first world war that are very much about it's like from soldier boy to general and things like that and recruiting for kitchener's army and 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 board games around that and then you see it you know now of games like call of duty and the kind of uh the military kind of funding video games and and things like that and so there is a there's a there's a long history of games and play being used as tools of recruitment but i mean i mean there's the most obvious one of course is the what did you do in the great war daddy poster with the little boy playing toy soldiers at his feet um, it's, yeah it's a whole kind of this kind of domestic kind of recruitment but then there's there's a kind of long history of kind of almost kind of games being used as a way to get to children and then as a way to get to their parents there's kind of a game from the early 19th century which is a game about empire and it was made by a quaker family and it's very critical of a mercantilist and uh, kind of uh, military empire but very pro spiritual empire and it's very much about reflecting on Britain's sins and it's kind of saying oh what are we doing over there when we're terrible here kind of thing and uh, it actually says in the game it's like oh the children you know children what you have learned on this game you should spread this message to your parents you should spread this message to to adults that you know and this idea that these kind of games are a way of kind of accessing youth and then the youth will then go and you know and spread the message and things like that so it's almost a way of bypassing uh parents what well, are the quaker board game manufacturers producing during the first world war i mean it's not very uh good business sense to be producing anti-war conscious conscious objective games no so the quaker the so the quaker specific kind of so the darton family is the main kind of quaker family that produces a lot of educational ephemera and board games and stuff and they're kind of late 18th early 19th century and then as far as i'm aware um most of the kind of the game manufacturers become much more kind of 
general game publishers they kind of lose this kind of I guess kind of family identity or kind of spiritual identity as far as I'm aware there might be kind of smaller games because I look at mainly larger commercial games um, and games that are covered by trade journals and things like that but as far as I'm aware I haven't come across a Quaker first world war game that would be very interesting to see. (laughs) I'm also wondering about you know when you're talking about smaller games and this is back to my question about men playing board games in the trenches, the sort of, um, uh, to, pick, to pick up on an idea that I've been thinking about, that I've been working with someone in terms of medicine, but uh, sort of vernacular games, you know, knots and crosses drawn on the side of a trench wall type thing. Um, you're not looking at that at all in your research. In, in the research I did for my MPhil, not really because I was doing kind of more of a commercial history, but the what I'm doing now for my PhD, I'm much more interested in kind of this um, because I look at a lot of kind of pubs and games played in pubs and, uh, and you know, and, and board games themselves have a lot. So like folk games and things like that, like there's in, oh God, I'm going to get the cathedral wrong. I think it's Gloucester Cathedral. There's like a game, like a, a board game scratched into, <laughs> they kind of carved into the stone at one point, like a board parishioner carved a kind of game of fox and geese into the stone and things like that. So kind of these games, um, you know, if a board game is just a game we play, which has a kind of space of play, then they're very transferable uh, they're very easy to play this is a bit off topic but something I just remembered in the the games and to- basically the games and toys trade journal is just the most fascinating thing because I was going in expecting a trade journal to be incredibly dry and just kind of with my experience with them but it's a really really weird kind of very personal very kind of bitchy trade journal like it kind of it kind of kind of says oh you know Mr so-and-so has given up his toy drum business after a slight injury you know you know kind of good for him kind of thing like that it's it's very weird but they cover games um kind of the they cover kind of games that were played um this is uh uh second world war in the shelters and they kind of cover and it's really interesting it's kind of um it's talking about morbid games and it was about oh you know people now there's a popular thing in in shelters where people are going uh what would be kind of the funny like funny last words essentially it would be like oh that bombs ages away and things like that I get it's covering all this stuff and the stuff like that I find is just is really really interesting that kind of use of dark humor and play and stuff is kind of almost coping if you if you have a surface and you can mark a surface you can play a game essentially I generally look through for references for what men are reading because that that was that's always interested me but now I'm going to go back and look at and see what games they're playing other than Crown and Anchor, um, which they all play Crown and Anchor at some point. Um, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> very good. So what are we talking about next time, Chris? <laughs> well, I suspect, Angus, that we'll be going further down uh, our game's rabbit hole, but the actual details for that remain <laughs> unresolved at this time. <laughs> More modern games, I think. Not not the benighted Monopoly. No. Yes. No, not Monotony, of which I have three copies of, and not no. told my told my daughter I have them. We're not playing it <laughs> at all ever. I think Grandma has a copy <laughs> that's never been produced either. Nobody in our family likes Monopoly, yet we seem to have lots of versions of it. And then you can't throw them out once you've got your own specific version, can you? Once you've got the Yorkshire version, the Hampshire version, <laughs> the Granddad's version. <laughs> They've got you then. <laughs> yeah, we, we did, but we're not yeah. playing it. We've never progressed beyond junior monopoly, I'm glad to say. For aspiring capitalists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's it for now. Uh, thank you, Holly, for joining us. That was wonderful. And uh, I guess we'll be back next month with more War Games talk, probably. I hope so. <laughs> oh, 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 it's a lovely Come for a drink, Todd. How can we spend the money we earn?